All right, welcome everyone to the April 16th uh, Applied Topology in Albany seminar, also known as ATIA. Um, this is our first joint seminar with the uh, workshop on topology, identifying order and complex systems. Um, uh, we've actually luckily been able to sort of pair some of our lectures or our presentations with some of the uh, lectures in that seminar. Um, and so uh, um, I'm happy that we were able to make room for, for both talks today because Paul Bendich will be speaking at, uh, at three uh, o'clock. Um, this talk should be about 50 minutes. It's obviously recording, but once we go to q and I'll stop recording um, so that people can feel free to ask uh, maybe silly questions. All right, um, Mike, would you like to introduce Luis? Yeah, sure. So we're happy to have Luis here today with us for our first official joint seminar, I guess. Luis is a recent graduate of Western University uh, in, in Canada and uh, is doing some really interesting work in applied topology and, and TDA and, and we're happy to have him here today, as I said. So yeah, Luis, please uh, go ahead and start when you're ready. All right, so thanks for the introduction. Hope everyone can hear me all right and can see what I'm writing. Um, so yeah, thank you. Let me thank the organizers of the Applied Topology in Albany seminar for inviting me and also the, the organizers of the workshop uh, on topology for kind of moving their talk an hour later. So also thanks uh, Paul Bendig for accepting doing that. So I can, so I mean, the two talks don't happen at the same time. That's really important for an early career research as myself. So I really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about approximate uh, notions of vector bundles, and this is joint work with Jose Perea. Um, and so the idea is to start by, I mean, I said that I wouldn't assume people know about vector bundles or know a lot about those. So I'm going to introduce that first, and then I'm going to say a little bit about characteristic classes. Then I'm going to tell you uh, how these things may appear in practice and how one kind of needs to relax the notion of vector bundle to make sense out of that in a practical application. And then how such a relaxation works, which is uh, the joint work with, with Jose. This is a paper that appeared today on the archive. Um, and how we can apply these notions to kind of deal with the examples that I'm going to introduce. So let's start. So a vector bundle is a continuous function and just to give you a few names, uh, the call domain of the function is called the base. And usually one wants to study vector bundles over a fixed base. And what varies is the total space, which is the domain of the function. And uh, for it to be a vector bundle, we want the total space to be a disjoint union of many copies of R to the D, where D is the rank of the vector bundle. D is some uh, natural number. And we want this to be a set. So we want Y to be a disjoint union of many copies of Euclidean spaces as sets, one for each uh, element of B. But as a topological space, we want it to be a bit, more, a bit more interesting. It essentially can be anything as long as it is locally trivial. And instead of giving you the precise definition of what locally trivial is, I'm going to show you a picture that should be good enough. So suppose that you have a vector bundle. In this example, the base is the circle, S1, and the total space is the Mobius one. And we see that the um, kind of the, the pre image of each point is a, a, a Euclidean space, a, a real vector space, in this case of dimension one. So this is a rank one um, vector bundle. And in what sense is this locally trivial? Well, locally trivial means that I can cover the base by open sets in such a way that when I restrict the vector bundle to each of the open sets, I get something that is trivial. And trivial means that it is a product of the base and the fiber. So in this case, after I restrict the vector bundle to a certain uh, open of the cover, it ends up being uh, isomorphic to the open of the cover times the fiber. So that's what trivial means. I mean, trivial is being the product of 
the base and the fiber, and locally trivial means that that happens locally. Uh, maybe one of the most important examples of uh, vector bundles are the tangent bundles of differentiable manifolds. And this uh, is going to appear later. And this is basically what we need to know about the general definition of vector bundle. Uh, we're going to denote vector bundles up to isomorphism. I didn't tell you what an isomorphism of vector bundles is, but it is after you read the definition is what you come up with. Um, we're going to denote, denote those by vect uh, of B. So these are all vector bundles over B up to isomorphism. This is a set and it's going to be important for us. Okay, so uh, one way to describe a vector bundle is to give it using a cocycle. And that's what we're going to uh, see right now. I see cocycles, I like to interpret cocycles as recipes. I, I understand cocycles as a recipe to construct a bundle. In this case, these cocycles are going to take values in, in some uh, group of matrices. So they are going to construct vector bundles. So how do we construct a vector bundle? Suppose that I want to describe to you the Mobius band vector bundle that we just saw. The first thing that you're going to do is you're going to take your base and you're going to cover it by some open sets. Then you're going to take each element of the base and you're going to take a product with a fiber. And we are not done because this is not a vector bundle. Um, the problem is that if, if you want this to be the Mobius one, then you better glue these things together. And in order to do that, you basically have to tell me how to glue. If you have a point here, it's going to have two fibers. So you have to tell me how to glue those fibers. And that's exactly what a cocycle does. So a cocycle is going to be a family of functions from the intersections to some uh, to the automorphisms of the fiber. In this case, we are taking the orthogonal group as the automorphisms of R to the D. Um, you could take other groups, but for us, we are just going to look at the orthogonal group. Um, so this, this cycle is what's going to tell you how to glue the fibers. So let me show you in a picture. If you have a point in an intersection, that intersection kind of embeds in both open sets. So the, the, the fiber of this point appears kind of twice. And again, you have to tell me how to glue those together. And that's what the cycle tells you what to do or, or how to do. And this is almost all you need to describe a vector bundle. But there's one last piece. You have to make sure that these gluings make sense. So what does that mean? So you want, you want to make sure that these gluings are consistent. And this is ensured by the cocycle condition. But before reading this formula, let me just show you a picture. If you have a point in a triple intersection, then the point is going to come with three fibers, one for each open set. It's going to have a fiber according to this open set, a fiber according to this one, and a fiber according to this one. And the cocycle is going to tell you how to glue each pair of fibers. But you better make sure that if you glue this with this according to these two gluings, you get the same gluing as if you do this. That's exactly what the cocycle condition ensures. So. A cocycle is going to be a family like this um, that satisfies the cocycle condition. And we're going to denote those by Z1. These are, these are usually called check cocycles. And these are Z1 of U because these are cocycles that are defined of, on this open cover uh, with values in the orthogonal group. And again, these are these families defined on every uh, pairwise intersection. This could be empty, and then you don't have to do anything. But if it's non empty, you have to give me a function. And uh, they have to satisfy the cocycle condition. OK, so cocycles are recipes to construct vector bundles. And basically, what I just said can be summarized in the following way. Given a cocycle here, you can construct a vector bundle using this formula. And the formula that I'm giving you here is the formula for the total space, where you take each open set of the cover. You take the product with a fiber, you take a disjoint union of those, and then you quotient, you take this gluing that I was talking about that the cocycle gives you. And, and the fact that the cocycle satisfies the cocycle condition ensures that this is an equivalence relation. Okay, so are cocycles and vector bundles the same thing? Well, almost. 
in order to make them the same, you have to kind of quotient the, the notion of cocycle a little bit. So first of all, we are going to quotient by fiber-wise change of basis, which is kind of informal. What it means is if, if you took this product, but now you change kind of the basis of this R to the D everywhere, you would be constructing the same vector bundle. So, I mean, I know that this is not super precise, but it, it doesn't matter for us. I'm just telling you there is a notion of change of basis by which you should quotient. After you do that, you get this set. This is usually called check cohomology, restricted to this uh, open cover. And as I said before, this change of basis doesn't change the vector bundle that you get in the end. So this extends. And these are still not the same thing. You have to do one more thing. You have to allow me to consider any cover. You cannot just fix a cover once and for all to get all vector bundles. You have to allow me to refine and make the covers as, as, as fine as I want. So you have to take the colimit over all covers. And this is what's usually known as check cohomology of B with coefficients in the orthogonal group. And after you do that, you get an isomorphism or a bijection. So the conclusion of all of this is that vector bundles over a base P are the same thing as these check cycles modulo these two things. Um, and if you want to be super precise for this, you need B to be paracompact, but that's, that's not going to be super important for us. We, we just assume that B is a nice topological space. Okay, so cycles are recipes for constructing vector bundles. And after you do these things, they are actually the same thing. Okay, in order to, to talk about characteristic classes, I have to tell you about yet another way of describing a vector bundle. And that's uh, what a classifying map is. The idea of a classifying map is the following. You want to see, you have B, and you want to see a vector bundle over B as literally a vector space parametrized by B. So you want to have some space here, which uh, we have to construct, such that a map from B into that space is basically giving me a continuous family of vector spaces. So as I change the point in B, so if I have a path, I want to have like a continuous deformation of one vector space into another one. Uh, and this is the space that we're gonna kind of introduce right now. So this space is called a Grassmannian. And first one needs to introduce this Grassmannian which is, it's gonna be a topological space whose elements are the d-dimensional subspaces of R to the N. And fine, as a set, that makes sense. I can consider the set of all d-dimensional subspaces of R to the N. But if I want to make that a topological space, I have to give it a topology. There are various ways uh, for doing that that give you the same topology. Uh, the one that is gonna be most natural for us is the following. You can imagine, or you can actually see this space as a subspace of square matrices by identifying a subspace of R to the N with the orthogonal projection onto it. This is a matrix that projects orthogonally onto this subspace. Um, and, and for each subspace, there is exactly one orthogonal projection onto it. So this is kind of uh, like a one-to-one -one uh, correspondence between the elements or the, the d-dimensional subspaces of R to the N and this projection matrices. Um, and here, I mean, this, this is a projection of rank D because it's projecting onto a v-dimensional, a d-dimensional subspace. Um, so this is how we give it a topology because this has a topology. And how can we, I mean, how, let's be explicit about that topology. We are going to first metrize this using the Frobenius norm. Uh, if you never heard about the Frobenius norm, just imagine the Euclidean norm. The Frobenius norm is just a fancy name for the Euclidean norm uh, in this space of matrices. And so this gives you, gives you a metric here, in particular gives you a topology, and then it gives you a topology here. So this is our topological space of d-dimensional subspaces of R to the n. Now, um, you, can, you can take an increasing union of all of this, uh, basically because R to the um, N includes in R to the N plus one, for example, by 
adding a, a, a component of zeros at the end. Uh, this lets you take this, this increasing union. And now you have, you can see this as the space of d-dimensional subspaces of R infinity. Uh, this is not super important. The main, the main thing is that there is a space whose points are basically d-dimensional vector spaces, real vector spaces. And now there's a formula which you shouldn't pay too much attention to. The, the only point of, of having this here is to just convince you that there is a formula that is not super complicated and that involves a cocycle and a partition of unity that given a cocycle uh, on, on a cover over B of B gives you back a continuous map from B to the Grassmannian. And this is exactly what we wanted. You, we wanted to see a vector bundle, uh, which is kind of a thing that has uh, all these vector spaces as a continuous map where kind of we're sending this point to its fiber, but now seeing as a point in a Grassmannian. And now the question is the same. Are these two things the same? Well, almost. If instead of considering cocycles over a specific base, uh, over a specific cover, you consider all cocycles over any cover, and you also uh, quotient by this change of, of uh, basis. And if instead of just considering continuous maps from B to the Grassmannian, you consider those up to, up to homotopy, uh, then these two things are the same. So this is a, bi a bijection again. It's natural in B. It's really nice bijection. And the conclusion of all of this is that a vector bundle can be seen as a cocycle or as a continuous map from B into this special space called Grassmannian. OK, and we're all almost done with the theory. Uh, I mean, the classical theory. We have to talk about characteristic classes. So this is what we just saw. We can see vector bundles as cocycles and as classifying maps. In particular, if you have some vector bundle over B, you can consider its classifying map. And this is a continuous map from B to a Grassmannian. And you can use this map to do the following. Suppose that you have some cohomology class in the Grassmannian. Here R is some ring. You have some cohomology class of the Grassmannian. You can use this classifying map to pull back this class and get a cohomology class over B, of B. Um, the classes that you can get in this way are called the characteristic classes of F. So you fix some vector bundle F, and now you pull back all the classes that you can from the Grassmannian. All of these classes, which are classes in the cohomology of B, are called characteristic classes of F. And they are very important because they are, they are isomorphism invariant. If you have two um, isomorphic vector bundles, then the characteristic classes of, that, of those vector bundles are exactly the same. They are the same object, the same element in the cohomology of the base. So characteristic classes are invariants of vector bundles. And we are going to focus on two characteristic classes or two families of characteristic classes. One uh, family is the, is the stiefel whitney classes. And these are classes that take a vector bundle over V, which now we are seeing as a cocycle, but you could see, see it as a, as a vector bundle or as a classifying map. And for each vector bundle and for each i, this is a natural number, they return a class in the ith cohomology of the base with coefficients in Z mod 2. This is one family. And then the other characteristic class is going to be a characteristic class of oriented vector bundles. I didn't mention this before, but there's a notion of an, a, a, a vector bundle having our, an orientation. And picking an orientation for your vector bundle is the same thing as giving it uh, with a cocycle taking values in the special orthogonal group. So if you have an oriented vector bundle, you can take its Euler class. And if the vector bundle is of rank D, uh, you get a, uh, an element in the D cohomology of B with coefficients in Z now. So fine, these characteristic classes to each vector bundle, they give us some elements in the cohomology of the base and they are invariant. So hopefully they are telling us something interesting about the, the vector bundles. In particular, we can use those to differentiate vector bundles. So let me give you two or a few examples of, of what you can do with characteristic classes. 
So characteristic classes give us abstractions to many interesting problems. For example, maybe the, the most basic is if you have a vector bundle F and it has some characteristic class that is non-zero, then F cannot be trivial. F cannot be a product of the base and the fiber. It has to be a bit more interesting than that at the very least. And the other thing that you can do is you can check if your vector bundle is orientable or not. So if your if your Stiefel Whitney or rather the first Stiefel Whitney class is zero, exactly if the vector bundle is orientable. And you can do many other things, but I'm just going to give you two examples, um, very briefly, just to kind of convince you that there are many other uses. Uses, for example, if if the Euler class of your vector bundle is non-zero, then you know for a fact that it doesn't have a nowhere vanishing section. And then you can use the Stiefel Whitney classes of the tangent bundle of a manifold to get obstructions to embedding the manifold in Rn for some small n. And this is, I think, one of the, the reasons why this, this was studied in the first place. Um, OK, so this is all there is to, I mean, all that I'm going to describe about vector bundles in the classical setting. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to, to answer them. Um, otherwise, I'm going to go to applications. All right. So vector bundles in applications, is, is this a thing? Um, and the answer is yes. I mean, there are many things that look like vector bundles, so that it, there better be a vector bundle somewhere. Let me show you an example. Suppose that you have a, um, a dynamical system. And for us, a dynamical system is going to consist of the following. It's going to be a phase space, which is just a topological space. And then there's going to be an action of time, basically, that given a time and a particle is going to take that particle somewhere else. Basically, it's going to be the system acting on the phase space. And the phase space is just basically the, um, all the states in which a particle in the system can be. Fine. Um, and, and this is not the very precise definition of the dynamical system, but this is enough for our purposes. Now, we're going to be interested in studying dynamical systems, but by studying their attractors. So what's an attractor? An attractor is going to be an invariant set of the dynamical system. And an invariant set is a set, is a subset of the phase space, such that when you act with the, with the dynamical system, all the points in there uh, go to points in, it, in, in there again. So it is invariant in the sense that any point in it, when you act with the dynamical system, uh, again falls inside that. Um, and for it to be an attractor, it has to have some sort of attracting property, which means that if you have something that is sufficiently close to the attractor, then in the limit, as, the, as time goes to infinity, it gets closer and closer to the attractor. And again, this is not uh, totally precise, but it is enough for our purposes. Um, OK, and, and the thing about attractors is that by studying the topology of the, of the attractors, you can, for example, distinguish dynamical systems, or you can, for example, use it for model val validation. If you have some model for a dynamical system, you can check the attractors in practice and the attractors in theory. And if they are different, then you know that your model is wrong. OK, and our goal is given a particle in the phase space say something about the geometry of the attractor. Um, this has been done already. And basically, the recipe goes as follows. I mean, this is one possible recipe, but it is a pretty popular one. You take your particle, and you let the system act on it. So you let kind of time pass, and you take some pictures like at, at like different times of where the particle is. Um, and usually, you, you don't really have access to everything about the particle. You don't know exactly where it is, or, or maybe you don't know that much. All you can do is measure something about the particle. You're going to have some function that is defined on the phase space, and it gives you some measure. It tells you something about the particle that is a real quantity. So really, what you have is a time series. You have a particle that is moving that you don't have access to. You measure something about the particle, and you get some uh, kind of sequence of measurements about that particle. And again, you want to use this to study the attractor, the topology of the, attra the attractor that the particle is converging to. So what you can do is 
whenever you have any time series, you can do uh, you can do a, a delay embedding, which to any time series and given some parameters gives you a point cloud in R to the n. Uh, and really, the details of this construction are not too important for us. The main thing is that I mean the details are in this formula, but if you don't want to read it, it's fine. The only important thing is that given a time series, you can get a point cloud. Um, and and the very kind of interesting thing about all this is that there's a theorem of takens that if you interpret it in the right way and you have like enough assumptions, tells you that this point cloud that you constructed using this time series is actually concentrated around a diffeomorphic copy of the attractor. In particular, if you have enough samples, you can say stuff about the topology of the attractor. And, and here, these assumptions also, I mean, this my hypothesis that I didn't give you, also assure you that uh, M is going to be a differentiable manifold. So let's see, let's see an example of this. Consider this dynamical system. It's called the double, double gyre, and it consists of two vertices that are, well, turning like vertices, and also moving left to right periodically in time. So let me. Let me show you, I hope you can see this. Uh, can anyone tell me if you can see this? Yep, I can see it. Excellent, thanks. So this is the double gyre in action. Um, I'm guessing that you're not getting a lot of frames per second. So I'm going to describe it very briefly. Here I put two kind of balls in some initial state and the, the, the red ball is kind of getting closer and then further away from the center of the leftmost uh, vortex. And the blue one is a bit more kind of um, regular. It's basically going in circles. The circles kind of shift a little bit, but it's basically going in circles. And hopefully you see that this consists of two vortices moving in time left to right. So that's the double gyre. Now, Okay, can you see this again? Yep. Yeah, and it was pretty smooth actually. Um. Okay, in my test it wasn't, but <laughs> that's good. Um, okay, so that's a double gyre. And so first of all, the phase, what's the phase space of this uh, dynamical system? So the phase space is not just this rectangle. The phase space is the rectangle times the circle because um, to know where, like, to know where a particle is gonna go next, you don't, don't not only need to know where the particle is right now, but you also need to know at what time it is there, because this dynamical system is varying in time. So the phase space is really this: it's a product of a rectangle and a circle. Um, and again, we want to study the attractors of these two balls, the blue ball and the red ball. And as I said, the red ball is kind of doing something weirder than the blue ball because it's getting further and closer to us to the center. So if you if you do all these takens uh, embedding thing, and you then I mean you get a point cloud and then you do some dimensionality reduction, you get these two things. This is this corresponds to the blue ball and this to the red ball, and the blue ball looks like kind of uh, a cylinder like a band with not nothing weird, but the red ball is doing this twisting here, and if you look at it very closely, you're gonna see that it's changing orientation here. In this little piece, it's changing orientation. And if you compute the persistence diagrams of this, I mean, this is an, really a thing embedded in R to the five, uh, R, R5, but um, I mean, in this case, it's very low dimensional, so we can see it, but in general, you wouldn't be able to see it. So you would, for example, compute a persistence diagram. You're gonna see this. So here, it's pretty clear that this is circular, uh, pretty convincing. Here, I mean, there is a circular, component to it, but there's also this. Um, and really this, uh, this uh, class is really comes from the fact that this is wrapped around itself. So it, it is, a, it is a, thing, a thing of the embedding. It's not an intrinsic property of, of the space. 
and and you can convince yourself that that's the case because these are these two things are happening at very different uh, metric scales. So if you want, you can you can just focus on this part of the diagram, and if you do that, um, you cannot distinguish these two things using homology, and you shouldn't use this to distinguish them because that's a that's an artifact of the embedding. So homology cannot distinguish these two things, um, but orientability should distinguish those. So how is it going to do that? So what we want to do is to approximate the tangent bundle, oops. Um, can you see the slides? Yeah, I can, but uh, it doesn't seem to be advancing. Uh, I see your marker okay. there. OK, yep. thanks, thanks. So what we want to do is to approximate the tangent bundle of these two things, and in some sense, realize that one is orientable and the other one isn't. And we want to use a persistence diagram to kind of see that it is not orientable. We want to use this first stifle whitney class that tells us if something is orientable or not. And the first stifle whitney class is an element in the cohomology, so we, we want to see it in the persistence diagram. OK. So one way to approximate a tangent bundle is to do local PCA. So PCA approximates a data set by a linear space, by linear subspace. Local PCA does that locally. So one way to do local PCA is the following. You take for each point some neighborhood. For example, you fix some k, and you take the k closest neighbors. And here I'm doing that for x and for y, which are two points, but you would do it for all points in your data set. Then you're going to apply PCA to each neighborhood. Um, and what you're going to get is basically a, in this case, I mean, K, uh, well, K is something. And then D, this target dimension is one. And I'm approximating this by a line. And the same thing with the other one. Um, but PCA doesn't only give you a subspace. It, if you ask it to, it's going to give you uh, an orthogonal, an orthonormal basis of, of the subspace. So if, if we see this as a, like an abstract subspace of R2, we are gonna, um, we're going to get a basis for it. And I think I actually miss, uh, mixed, yeah, I mixed X and Y, so sorry. But I mean, this should be Y, and the other one should be X. But in any case, um, PCA is going to give you a basis, an orthonormal basis for that. And you should think of this as a basis of the tangent space at X. Now, if you do this computation, this, um, this is a basis, an orthonormal basis, which you can, I mean, it's order, so you can think of it as a matrix. You can take this matrix, which what it does is just projects orthogonally from this subspace to this subspace. And now, the final thing that you can do is to approximate this by an orthogonal transformation, an orthogonal matrix. And in this case, the orthogonal matrix is going to be minus one because d is one, the dimension is one, so uh, it's a one by one matrix. Uh, so in kind of here, if this was the basis that you choose for for the tangent space at, at y, and this is the basis that you chose for the tangent space at x, then uh, you are changing orientation when you go from y to x. Um, fine. So why are we doing all that? Because we want to find a cycle for the tangent space of x. And this is, I think, basically the best thing that you can do. So uh, I mean, this is what many people do. So let's, uh, let's see why we're trying. I mean, in what sense are we getting a cycle? So we got these, these omegas. So they, they kind of smell cosycly. Um, and why are they a cycle? Or in what sense? Well, if now you have three points that are sufficiently close, then what's going to happen is that the spaces are going to be pretty similar. And these orthogonal transformations, when you compose them like this, are going to be very similar. If you do a, a composition or you just go there directly, that's going to be very similar. And, and then going to the orthogonal group is going to still going to have that property. So this composition is going to be very similar to this. And I'm not quantifying anything yet. Let's, let's be informal for a second. Uh, so what that means is that if you pick some epsilon that is sufficiently small and you construct the vitoris rips complex of x at distance scale epsilon, then this omega is going to be some sort of approximate cycle on it. 
it's going to be something very discrete. It's just going to be this defined on edges on the one dimensional simplices. And it's going to have this kind of approximate cocycle condition thing. OK, fine. Let me give you another example. And then we can go to making that precise. So suppose that I, I have a synchronization problem and I want to detect that I cannot solve it. Instead of just trying to solve it and failing, I want something that I can compute that tells me, don't even try. You, you just can't. The example is uh, kind of happens in cryo-electron microscopy, where you have 2D projections of a molecule that are taken from unknown angles. You don't have any control over the angle uh, from which you are kind of taking a picture of the molecule. You just get all this set of pictures. So imagine that you have your molecule and you're taking pictures from many angles and you're just given this set of pictures and you want to understand the global shape of the molecule. Um, and in this case, what we want to, what we want to do is given a data set like so, we want to just looking at the data being, be able to tell you, you cannot synchronize all of this. So what does synchronizing mean? I'll tell you what local synchronization means. If you have any two images, what you can do is to find the best rotation or the rotation that aligns those, team, those two things the best. Because if, if they are from very similar viewing angles, maybe this one was rotated, but if you unrotate it, they should be very similar images. So you can find these, um, these cosi or I mean these uh, omegas that kind of best align each pair of images. Now you can define a distance between images, which is basically the distance that is, I mean, you take any distance on images and you make it be SO2 invariant, basically by saying, okay, I, I just, I mean, I want to, uh, I want to compare the images after I align them the best way, the best way possible. And then I can construct a simplicial complex um, by taking uh, basically an edge uh, between images that are sufficiently well uh, aligned. Fine. And what I expect is that if epsilon is chosen is chosen to be sufficiently small, then these omegas are again going to be a cocycle. Because if, if there are two images that have a very similar viewing angle, then I'm going to be able to align them properly. The same thing with the third one. And if I align this one to fit this one, and then align this second one to fit the third one, that should be the same alignment as fitting the, the first one with the third one. And if I compute the persistence diagram of this Vietoris Rips complex in an example that I just constructed using some uh, like synthetic data, you get something like this. And the thing that we want to look at here is that we have this very persistent H2 that is really telling you that you're taking pictures from something that is kind of parameterized by a sphere because you have all these viewing angles and you're quotienting by rotations. So really only the angle uh, matters. And again, we want to somehow have a method that points at this class and tells us that, is, that is an obstruction to global synchronization. The fact that you are taking pictures from, from like a sphere thing uh, tells you that you're not gonna be able to uh, synchronize all of that. And that's basically, uh, that reduces to the fact that the tangent space, the ta tangent bundle of the sphere is non-trivial. Okay, so what is, a, what is an approximate cocycle? One way to make that precise is to fix a simplicial complex and define a discrete epsilon approximate cocycle to be just what we found in practice. You have a collection of matrices orthogonal matrices, one for each edge of your uh, simplicial complex. We want them to be symmetric so that if you go along one edge or if you come back, that's the same matrix. I mean, it's just the inverse. Uh, but then it has to satisfy this approximate cocycle condition. And this epsilon is some ep epsilon that you can choose and vary. So for each epsilon, you have a notion of discrete epsilon approximate cocycle. And this cocycle condition is only required on the triangles of your simplicial complex. Um, okay, that seems, I mean, that's not complicated. Can you do anything with that? So first of all, um, again, you, you want to quotient by this notion of change of, of um, basis because the change of basis doesn't change the underlying vector bundle. 
So we do that and we get this set that we call uh, maybe like the discrete check cohomology of K, the simplicial complex K, um, or the discrete epsilon approximate check cohomology. And now in this uh, approximate case, it's gonna be important that this has a metric. And the metric just comes from the fact that this is a family of matrices. So you can compare them using the Frobenius matrix, uh, the Frobenius metric. Uh, so you get a distance here. Doesn't matter exactly how it is defined, but there's a distance on this set that is gonna be important for uh, studying stability of, of constructions. Final piece of information that we need, um, this fact uh, that appears in a paper by Tina Rush. If you have the Grassmannian that we defined earlier and you include it in a thickening, this is seen as subspaces of R infinity times infinity with the Frobenius metric. Then if the thickening is not too big, square root of two divided by two, then this retracts. So these two things are homotopy equivalent. Fine. So the main theorem now is that the classical map that we had from check cycles to classifying maps extends to approximate cycles to some sort of notion of approximate classifying maps. So if you have an approximate cycle, you don't get a map from K to the Grassmannian. You have, to, you have kind of the error that, that the cycle has, you have to take that into account. So you have to thicken the Grassmannian in order to be able to land somewhere. So fine. And, and this thickening is linear in epsilon. So, I mean, the, the better epsilon is, the smaller epsilon is, the, the, the less you have to, to thicken the Grassmannian. And now using this lemma, if epsilon is sufficiently small, smaller than uh, one half, then these two things are actually the same. I mean, they're in bi canonical bijection. And this is the set of vector bundles over K. So given an approximate cycle, if epsilon was smaller than one half, you get a vector bundle. It's a true vector bundle. Um, if you can tell, if you can say anything about that vector bundle, well, that's a question, but, but at least there is something. And this something is, is well-defined in the sense that it is stable. So if you had two cycles that were very similar, for example, PCA gave you a very similar basis or there was some like numerical thing, um, the true vector bundle that we just assigned to it is the same. So this, this is useful in practice because at the very least it's defining a quantity that is stable uh, with respect to small perturbations. And I didn't tell you what the perturbations are. That's, I mean, they are just linear in, in epsilon. It's not, uh, it's not very complicated. Uh, and this is just an observation. If you, if you take this theorem and you think about it a little bit, you, you see that you can, def you can represent any vector bundle over a triangular ball space with a discrete cycle, um, but you may need to, to uh, subdivide the simplicial complex. So, I mean, it's, it's gonna get very large very quickly, but you can in principle do it. So you can, you can describe any vector bundle with a finite amount of data using cycles, approximate cycles. Okay, so that's the first thing. And can you do anything with this vector bundle? And the answer is you can at the very least do the following. You can compute some characteristic classes. So there are algorithms that take a, um, this critical cycle, and now you need epsilon to be smaller than two in this case, and compute the first stiefel winnie class. And for the second stiefel winnie class and the Euler class, uh, you need epsilon to be smaller than one, and the Euler class, at least the, the algorithm that is written in the paper, is really only works for uh, the second, I mean, the Euler class of a two-dimensional vector bundle. Um, but this is, this is already pretty good because this group is the, is the circle and there are lots of um, synchronization problems where, where you want to synchronize by rotating. So you have these algorithms, they are stable, uh, meaning that if you have two things at distance less than two, you get the same uh, stiefel windy class and here distance less than one, you get the same, distance less than one, you get the same. And if epsilon is even smaller, uh, you are computing the stiefel whitney classes of this vector bundle. So what are these algorithms doing? I mean, they, they are taking an approximate cost cycle. So what are they really computing? Well, if epsilon is sufficiently small, you're computing 
a class of a vector bundle that we know how to describe in theory. Okay, and these algorithms are computable. They are polynomial, except this one, which is um, exponential in D. But for small d, I mean, if d is less than like eight, you can you can run it, and that that already gives you some interesting examples. So let's let's conclude by. Yeah, let's conclude by uh, going back to the examples and seeing how this can be used to do what we we wanted to do. So we wanted to distinguish these two things. And basically we run local PCA and we got this approximate cocycle. And the idea now is that you're gonna take an epsilon that is sufficiently small so that the approximate cocycle is a two approximate cocycle because our algorithm needs epsilon to be at most two. And now you run the algorithm, you get a cocycle uh, with coefficients in Z mod two on some Vitoris Rips complex and you write it in the basis, in the persistent cohomology basis. Um, and what you get is the following. In this case, the cocycle is just zero, represents the zero element of the cohomology. Whereas in this case, the cocycle is the sum of these classes. So this very persistent class and some other classes. Um, so in particular, this class, which is representing kind of this whole, uh, as you go around that hole, the local PCA uh, approximation is changing orientation. That's what's happening. And here, what is this gray thing that I drew? It is basically the, the part of the persistence diagram that can contain generators that sum to this stiefel winnie class. So this is just to check that we are not cheating. We allow for this class to appear in the persistent in the in the stiefel winnie class but just doesn't. The stiefel winnie class is zero and, and that doesn't appear there. So we're not changing orientation as we go around. And here you see it in the, in the picture. So it's, I mean, it's just a sanity check. And for the other case, uh, we had this persistence diagram and we wanted to use it to, to somehow tell us you cannot synchronize this data. So we had this co-cycle that we constructed aligning images pairwise. Uh, we had this distance, which is the distance between images up to rotations. Uh, this satisfies an approximate cocycle condition. Again, we choose the maximum epsilon for which it satisfies the one approximate cocycle condition because we want to apply the, the Euler class algorithm. We apply the Euler class algorithm and really we get a, a, a cocycle taking uh, with coefficients in Z but you can always uh, mod it by three. And, and if you do two, you're gonna get zero because the Euler class of the sphere is zero. Um, so that's why you have to take some other number, prime. And, and again, this, the Euler class is precisely this uh, very persistent thing. Um, in particular, that element is basically telling you, it's giving you an obstruction to global synchronization, at least in this kind of distance scales. Um, yeah, and that's that's all I prepared. Um, this paper again it was is up today. Um, these two papers are basically where we took inspiration for the examples in this talk, and this is another approach to computing characteristic classes uh, by Rafael Tinarash. That if you are interested in these kind of things, you should take a look at. And thanks a lot for your attention, and thank you, Jimena Fernandez, for. Uh, helping me with the dynamical system animation that was really cool. So, great, yeah. and thank you, Luis. Let's give everyone uh, let's give Luis a round of applause. Um, so I'm going to stop recording.